the other one, you bastard! In the past several years, the leader class has come across somewhat of a predicament. Prices for manufacturing keep going up, but the actual cost of toys haven't. I mean, you look at what they were delivering decades ago, and yeah, they just couldn't do this today, given the budget that's required for them, but no one these days would accept leader class undergoing a 50% budget increase. It's just marketing. I mean, think about what the deluxes go through every single time, when people complain about a $2 price increase, for God's sake. Don't deny that you've seen it, because you've seen it. So the solution? Well, introduce a brand new size class and advertise it as a brand new experience. But in reality, it is a Trojan horse for the old, in more ways than one. I mean, it's named after some of the Dark of the Moon Cyberverse figures. They keep reusing size class names! Stop it! So of course, the first attempt was Jetfire, and he well and truly justified his inflated price tag. Ultimately, he didn't make my personal top of 2019 list just because of personal preferences, but there's no denying that this is what a classic leader would have been if the price increased today. However, I was a little bit skeptical about how their second outing would go. I mean, we just got a pretty acceptable Skylynx 5, wait, wait, 5? Was it really five years since Combiner Wars? Oh my god. But yeah, comparatively recently, we just got a pretty decent Skylynx. Not to mention that marketing, engineering, and even releasing the damn character is pretty damn difficult. I mean, Mastermind Creations had to release it in two separate figure boxes. And finally, Jetfire was a fantastically engineered figure. So the question was, how the f could they top that? So let's put my skepticism to the test. Is this truly worth the commander price point? And is this truly the definitive Skylinks? Well, to answer these questions, greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to Earthrise WFC E24 Commander Class Skylinks. Now, right off the bat, for those who aren't familiar with the third season of Generation 1, and to be honest, I don't blame you considering half of the G1 community hates that segment with a passion for some reason, Skylinks is somewhat of a weird fellow. In essence, he's kind of a duobot hive mind thing. He comes with two components, which both make up his collective consciousness. And yes, I know it might seem weird that I'm explaining who a character like Skylinks is, but believe me, I've seen countless people confused about the nature of him. But anyway, as such, his alt modes come in two components, the shuttle and a sort of carrier. Taking a look at the latter first, yeah, it's definitely the weaker the two design-wise. Now, to many, this will be no surprise, considering the nature of the original toy. It's literally designed to be a box that turns into a set of legs, and maybe a Lynx if you're feeling a little bit extra special on any given day. And yes, Lynx doesn't refer to the name of this specific component. It's actually the cats that he specifically turns into, hence the name Sky Lynx. But we'll save that for a little later. As for now, yeah, I don't really see what they could have done with the size class. This is one of the reasons why MMC split it into two separate releases, not because of the difficulty of getting a bird half right, but in order to get the alt mode of the Lynx to work. Granted, I don't think it's much better, and I commend the designers for at least trying here, but as far as looks are concerned, yeah, it's basically a giant brick with legs. Flow between these parts is virtually non-existent, and the colour breakup is all over the place. Conceptually, this alt mode is dog shit, but as the execution of a dog shit idea, it's f brilliant. Right off the bat, the actual build quality is way better than I would have imagined. Jetfire was built pretty damn solidly, but it was definitely a slightly softer plastic. I originally chalked this up to the limitations of the 150 Australian dollar budget, but seeing how well built this thing is, it really just blows me away. Furthermore, the sculpted detail is absolutely gorgeous. If we're talking about line work on its own, this is the shit masterpiece wishes it was able to replicate. This feels like classic Japanese toy design at its finest, with so many fine details all over the place. It's also accentuated by an incredible healthy dose of paint details. In junction, these details look spectacular. The front section attempts to replicate a faux door, since of course they couldn't put anything legitimate there thanks to the transformation, and it works quite well. Also helps that the ports here are 5mm, and as a result war for Cybertron Blast effects compatible. This looks incredibly stupid in all the right ways. The top section has been coated in this gorgeous round of gunmetal. It's quite humorous that you have the treads left over from the base mode, which is actually an element I take issue with, but as far as other alt mode artifacts go, this isn't too egregious. You also get nice chunks of gunmetal on the sides in the form of of the treads and, uh, whatever these things are supposed to be. Look, these and the silver paint applications are mainly meant for the robot mode, but they still look really cool. They even went to the extra trouble of adding red to try and tie in the leg aesthetic into the rest of the giant box, which is quite commendable. So yes, as a concept, this toy box outsourced to Tony box set thing is pretty f 
stupid. But in execution, they've pulled out pretty much as many stops as they could have with the budget given. And fortunately, it's not just a sitting duck, or lynx, I suppose. The back panel unfolds twice to reveal a MicroMaster compartment, and you know me, I love myself some MicroMaster compatibility. It's a really nice way to make use of the space that would otherwise just be left hollow. I mean, on a $150 mainline transformer, even if it was a store exclusive in Australia, it's not really feasible to put a bunch of torso articulation, so what else can you do? Make the hollow section actually worth something. It's also roughly the same width as the Ironworks road pieces, although it doesn't really connect as well as one would hope from this angle, opting to place that compatibility into the actual base mode. From a personal standpoint, I am quite disappointed, but from an analytical one, I kinda get why they did it, although I'll get into those specifics in a little bit. Still, this tiny characteristic goes a long way into making this random brick of a thing actually quite fun. Yes, the back section makes the legs even more obvious, and sure, the connection tab is a little annoying, but at the end of the day, if you look at this thing and don't suddenly start hearing the Thunderbirds theme, well, I don't know what's wrong with you, man. And then moving on to Shuttle Ma Jesus Christ, this thing looks absolutely gorgeous! Holy f this has got to be one of the most beautiful shuttles that Transformers has done in the modern era. Like, just looking at this thing, yeah, the Combiner Wars one can f*** right off. Unlike the brick, which was a dumb idea that had a really great execution, this has both the idea and the execution nailed right off the bat. And you want to know why this shuttle mode is so gorgeous? Take a look at the logo here. Yep, Hasbro actually teamed up with NASA to get the shuttle mode proportions to look as realistic as possible. And oh boy, does it show. Now, yes, this is a fictional shuttle, as there's no such thing as the Magnificence within their Air Force. Is that what you call their rocket lineup? But whether this is 100% accurate to the vehicle or not, all the details that you'd expect a shuttle to have are here and accounted for. I'm not going to go over them because unlike Cybertron Blacksmith, I'm no vehicle buff, but just looking at this vehicle, I can already get that feeling. Much like Jetfire, he uses the effect of white paint on white plastic to create a sort of slight contrast. However, in this instance, it feels far more deliberate. Like an old post-Harmony Gold lawsuit over here, the off-white paint seemed a little haphazard, trying to act as a replacement for the battle damage without really thinking why the battle damage worked as well as it did. And yes, I actually liked Siege battle damage, and I will die on that hill. But in the case of Skylinks, it's all incredibly purposeful. The white coats the edges of the wings, accentuating the silhouette and giving the effects that they act as protection whilst re-entering. It also makes an appearance on the back of the tail fin, and please let me finish this section so I can start gushing over the gold paint. <coughs> Not sure what the effect is supposed to achieve here, but it does look really cool. You also get a bit on the nose, which creates just enough contrast to keep the nose from being bland, although the mechanical detail also certainly helps. Like, Jesus Christ, there's just so much mechanical detail on this thing! Again, why would anyone prefer the flat cartoon surfaces over something like this, it just baffles me. There's also a lot on the bottom, which I suppose not only acts as replication of burning from re-entry, but also colour correction from the joint plastic. It also goes to show how durable the paint is, because after multiple combinations, this remains as solid as ever. Meanwhile, Starscream is chipping into oblivion, like, what the f***? And whilst on the bottom, damn, the kibble is extremely clean. Yeah, you've got the red plastic in the form of the bird feet and a few exposed joints, but compared to 99% of Jet Transformers, especially at this size, it's quite frankly amazing. And sure, this doesn't go through as much transformation as Jetformers, and I don't typically complain about the honest side of the Jet mode, and even then, a space shuttle is far more chunky than an F-15 or F-22, but still, look at it! And then there's one last tiny bit of off-white paint, which typically remains hidden out of the box. Opening up the top section reveals... Uh, that thing that shuttles have. Look, I don't know what it's f***ing called. It's just really cool, okay? This is something they 100% didn't have to do, but did anyways. And yes, it doesn't have any extra claw arms to use in junction with the MicroMasters or something similar, but I find using the extra appendage from Siege Ratchet works quite well, even if the port sadly doesn't go in all the way. Although, let's be real here, if you live in Australia like I do, the likelihood of owning a Siege Ratchet is unfortunately rather slim. Exclusives distribution really does suck. It's better than it has been for the past decade, but it's still awful. And oh boy, oh boy, do I finally get to talk about this gorgeous gold paint! Damn! Damn, this shit is shiny, and they've added it in healthy doses as well. Not only do you get this big chunk here, but you also get the lovely windows, the side in this gorgeous squared pattern, and a shit ton on the tail fin. There's a bunch of paint on this thing, but a lot of it's rather subtle, and as a result, it ends up feeling incredibly premium. And if that wasn't enough, the back section receives gunmetal on the immensely high number of thrusters. And yes, they did actually include the thruster modules on the side that everyone kept complaining Astro Train didn't have, so don't get your knickers in a twist. But seriously, these things are incredibly well detailed. It's clear this is one of the elements NASA was dead set on getting right. And overall, if this is the attention to detail that Hasbro is intent on bringing to their shuttle lineup, then the Astro Squad is going to be an incredible piece as well. And hey, that's two figures this year that'll piss off the Flat Earth account, which is always a plus. And that's not even getting into the minor stuff, like the gold-trimmed Autobot logos. Like, seriously, why hasn't this thing been more common outside of this and Horsemless Prime? I realize that, yes, this is a reference to the G1 toy, but the fact that it remained intact on both recent Skylink's attempts is the kind of luck that doesn't happen too often. And they even added landing gear, with wheels in 
included. Rolly poly keep on rolling! Look, I could spend hours and hours gushing about how well this vehicle mode is done, but at the end of the day, the sheer swooshableness sums it right up. Hypothetically, his predecessor should have more swooshability given the chunkier size and the larger wingspan, but I don't know, the shuttle mode of Skylinks is just doing things for me. That's not to say it doesn't have its fair share of issues though, because there are a few wibbly bits here and there. Nothing too crazy, but there are elements that I feel are a little bit underdone. For starters, yeah, the back section is a bit of a mess. Not in the visual sense, but in a structural one. Not only does the door not really tab on that way, but the tail fin pretty easily pops out. There's only one tab on the top of it, and the rest is just held together by friction. On a toy that's 150 bucks, I feel this is a bit of an oversight. Also, if we're going with personal gripes on the back, I really don't like the way it slopes upwards. In my opinion, it just makes it look tacky. Now, this can't really be considered a flaw, because take two seconds to do a Google search on what a space shuttle looks like, and you'll realize that this is actually accurate to the official design. I'm just saying that I personally don't like it. One thing that I could argue is properly tacky, though, is the text towards the front. I do like the name they gave it, as it ties in with Skylink's narcissistic nature, but the typeface they chose is rather ugly. I really hope that when Repro Labels makes a set, they manage to fix this in some shape or form without changing the shuttle name. On the topic of Repro Labels, I also hope that they cover up the joints here with a bit of white. I don't actually consider these exposed joints flaws per se, but it's definitely something I'd like to see fixed. But more than anything, given the apocalypse, I hope they take their sweet time instead, because heaven forbid overworking their staff and rushing a product. There aren't really that many design flaws on this particular element, though, to be honest. I mean, yeah, the wings pop off a smidge easily if you're ham-fisted, but I get why this is the case. It has to be like this, otherwise some stupid kid would break it. After accidentally breaking my perfect effect black Jinrai a couple of weeks ago, I appreciate this decision more than ever. Although there is one QC issue with my particular copy that I find quite peculiar. The tabs on the inside of these panels have come out of the box yellowed for some bizarre reason. Or at least I think they've come out of the box that way. I didn't really notice it until I took a closer look for the purpose of reviewing this guy. And since I primarily kept this area closed, I imagine it was like this prior to me opening the package. Still, at least it's better than some other documented QC issues with other figures. Why are you- ah! Actually, now that I think about it, there is one more thing that's a little bit of a nitpick. This guy practically has no 5mm ports on him, which would be fine and all if he didn't have any weapons at all, but you do get two sorts of turret thingies. They seem perfect for the aerial components, but sadly they don't fit anywhere. You can place them on the carrier, but unfortunately only on the sides, and they do look pretty stupid. In fact, in general, these are a bit sh** since they can't even stack on top of each other properly, despite having 5mm ports to do so. Bit of a missed opportunity. But hey, at least these two are also War for Cybertron Blast effects compatible. And this time you actually get effects. The catch is they're not unique. These are actually redecoed versions from the ones that came with Omega Supreme, only cast in neon orange as opposed to two-tone dark orange and black. Unfortunately, due to the way these work, you only get three long ones, but I think we all know that's not the point. The point is to use the three smaller ones as thruster fire on the back, and it does look pretty awesome, although it is a bit of a tight fit. And yeah, you're left with all this that doesn't really do anything Thing, given the actual weapons you get, but if I had to take a guess, I'd say that they ended up reusing the ones from Omega Supreme in order to cut costs on designing the rest. That in itself sounds sketchy, but when you consider the sheer amount of plastic that goes into these two figures, it does make sense. If this was the only way they saved money, then f kudos. Pretty much all the flaws I've mentioned are negligible anyway. There's nothing here that really ruins the overall experience, and hey, if keeping these separate wasn't tickling your fancy, then you know this is a f Skylinks, you all know what he does, you all know the drill. Also, there's a 5mm port on the bottom that should work with some beefy stands, but unfortunately none of mine are sturdy enough to support the weight. I wish I had a strong enough one, but alas, still take that as you will. Now, combining these two, though, has been somewhat of a hot topic, because many have claimed that their copy is incredibly loose. The accuracy issue doesn't affect mine, but it's common enough that I feel that I should at least mention the proper way to combine them so that you can test it first. You'll notice on the underside that there's a tab sitting between where the feet reside. This corresponds with a slot on the back of the roof of the carrier. After, of course, retracting the landing gear, what you want to do is gently slide it forward until you feel and or hear a soft click. Only then should you click the front into place on the latch. This method has been known to fix the looseness for at least a quarter of the people who've had this issue. However, if this doesn't work, then yes, you do indeed have a dud. This is why in general I always recommend buying from parties where you can ask for refunds or replacements. Aussie consumer law covers most, but if you can't chase it up, well... It's completely useless. But provided you can combine this guy properly, which as far as I can tell is still the majority of people, yep, it's a Skylinks alright. Again, much like the carrier itself, it's an incredibly stupid concept, however the designers have done a rather good job translating it into as cohesive a toy as they possibly could. At the very least, the legs keep to themselves at the back, flying with the overall wing structure. And yes, the front legs are a bit more prominent, but the shuttle on top is done so well that it distracts most of your focus. The front gunmetal section does a good job of flowing up into the shuttle itself. Ultimately though, it's still a Skylinks. It's an expertly done Skylinks, but it's still the big dumbass that every one knows and I guess kinda loves. I don't know how well he was received back in G1, but I imagine he was though, considering typically kids love dinosaurs, and he is kinda that. But that aside, it's a stupid design that has been executed to the highest quality. As far as these two modes separately and combined go, you're not really going to find a better one on the market. Sure, I can't really speak for the third party attempts, but considering the build quality and extra detail seen here, I do find it unlikely, articulation or no. And hey, these aren't even the main modes Skylinks is known for. It's nice that he packs in a lot of functionality here, but we all know why you'd buy a Skylinks. Unfortunately, there's one 
more thing we need to discuss before moving on to the promised land, though, and no, it's not the size comparisons, although yes, that is pretty important. Should mention that both of these guys are about leader size, with the shuttle component matching up with most of the modern ones, and the carrier elements matching up with the big classic chunky bastards. But no, unfortunately, we have to discuss the base mode that they kind of shoehorned into this thing, and yes, I do really believe it was shoehorned in at the last minute. Now, for the purposes of time, simplicity, and just because it's a pretty lazy mode, I'm not going to bother going through the transformation in depth. But regardless, at the end of it, oh, oh dear, this is not good. It's honestly almost as bad as Titan's Return Fortress Maximus has come himself, but thanks to them adding the extra hinges, it actually looks a smidge more cohesive. I mean, I like that they've painted all the extra detail on the inside, but what purpose do these ramps serve? And yes, this is the reason you can't plug in most of the ramps properly into the vehicle mode, which to me seems like a massive oversight. The feet are a joke, practically doing nothing. I suppose this mode could be saved if the shuttle plugged in properly, but I'm sorry, it just doesn't. And yeah, you can kind of support it with the ramp, and it does look alright by virtue of having something purposeful amongst the random legs, but it's still barely pegged in. This is why I'm glad they didn't include a base mode with Jetfire. Some have speculated that he was supposed to have a base mode at some point, but I'm rather skeptical of this fact. Honestly though, even if they did, he is better for the fact that they didn't use it. And with Skylinks, I wish they'd incorporated this engineering into cleaning up the legs a bit instead. But hey, I get that line-wide gimmicks have to work, and they must have caught on to the fan modes that people were doing. It's also really cumbersome. It's big and clunky without really justifying its size. Like, are collectors really going to use this mode that much, and are kids really gonna play with this formation? I don't think either market is particularly interested in such things, especially with better base modes being released. And yes, I do understand that they had to include some form of base mode in order to tie into the line-wide gimmick. Let's be real here, as frustrating as some gimmicks can be, they do sell toy lines. How many of you who grew up with Revenge of the Fallen like I did think that Mecha Live was the coolest sh back in the day? Hell, when you think about it, going as far back as G1, sh like the Gestalt were considered gimmick toys. In this instance, they went for the base compatibility gimmick, so it makes sense that they had to include one in some capacity. It doesn't change the fact that it sucks though, that's for sure. Fortunately, with one exception, it doesn't really impact the other modes. And with that, most of the flaws are behind us as we move into one of the most satisfying transformations of the whole year. Skylinks's two different components have very, very simple transformations, almost on the deluxe class level. However, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that they are boring, they are very, very addictive. The heavy use of ratcheted joints make this thing oh so satisfying to transform, as you're gonna see in a moment. Now each of the legs transform identically, first thing you want to do is click it out a little bit so that it untabs from there, rotate it down on those oh so satisfying ratchets, and then ratchet the foot down, and that's basically it, then you can just kind of pose however you like. You then come underneath and bring up this panel here. Then that will allow you to rotate the Link's head up like that, just on that hinge there, and a second hinge here. And then collapse a Rooney. And don't forget to bring out the tails at the back, a lot of people do for some reason. Now that that's done, you move on to the shuttle component. Open up this panel on the back, it's on a double hinge. There's only one tab keeping the whole thing together and you just kind of pull it all the way out. Disconnect the two wings from the sides here, then you use these two hinges to rotate them into place. Then coming underneath, you've got this like so, and that out like that. So not really hinges, more like rotation points here and here, and then that just locks it into place. Then underneath, the legs are very simple. You just ratchet them down out of there. They're pegged into the top there. And then you rotate the foot down, and you bring the toes into place. And of course, you can kind of pose them however you like. And last but not least, you literally just grab the head and pull it all the way out on the neck like that. Don't be gentle with it, you just pull it out really toughly. And then you rotate into place however you like, and if you so desire, you open the jaw as well. So yeah, it's different in comparison to a lot of Transformers who have similar sizes. There's not a lot of pieces that get this to work. The parts count aims to make the joints feel as good as they do, to make a premium experience, as opposed to a premium million step conversion. It's simple, but oh god is it effective. Now, in separated robot modes, these guys are pretty good. They both make sacrifices on their own, but thankfully it'll all make sense in a bit. But for now, the Lynx component is definitely the stronger of the two build quality-wise. This is where a lot of the paint that was present earlier comes to life. The red on the sides that existed to tie the leg aesthetic into the whole thing now works as lovely stripes that carry to the backs of the tails, as well as doubling as references to the original G1 toy. And yes, the base mode treads are still on the top and are even more comical in this mode, but the gunmetal overall brings the top section to life, to the point where even the hidden ramp sections break up the blue nicely. Not to 
say the blue is boring though, the plastic they chose is positively lovely. It's deep enough to feel extremely premium, but shiny enough to not look flat and boring. Matter of fact, none of the plastics used here seem as such. I mean, you could kind of say that the tails look a little unpainted, but only under a few select lighting conditions, and there's enough sculpted detail to distract you from it. I also really like the way they've been reimagined as sort of connection cables, with the big chunky ports on the end. They even added lasers, or lights, I don't know what these are, to the tips, which is hilariously awesome. Another hilariously awesome thing is that he's got roller skates, or tread skates, I presume. These would seem pretty goddamn ridiculous, but in the context of the articulation, it ends up blending extremely well. It kind of works in the same way as Generations Deluxe Warpath, where the design has such a maturity to it that you don't really see it as a dumb Easter egg, and more as a proud and premium battle feature. If there's one section I feel they didn't quite go all out, it would unfortunately be the head. Now don't get me wrong, design-wise it's fantastic. The sculpt work really brings to life the Link's aspect, as opposed to being confused for a bear or something. Yeah, these guys are far no. from Banjo and Kazooie. I really like how when you open the jaw, they included a gun tongue. Matter of fact, it's even separately articulated from everything else. So in junction with the blast effects, you really get some neat blast poses. The gold paint also returns as lovely as ever, but as good as the design is, there are a couple of disappointing aspects to it. Not enough to damn the entire thing, but they are slightly annoying. The worst offender is the next section, where you get this unsightly gap. And if that's not bad enough, the connection tab brings a lot of attention to it. I can kind of understand why this is a thing due to the transformation, but it still looks pretty ugly. Secondly, the jaw hinge is pretty loose, so using the giant Omega Supreme cannon blast just ain't gonna happen. It also doesn't have a stopping point, so you can actually dislocate his jaw. Ouchie, ouch. Also, the blue paint is a bit messy as well. Not sure if this is just my copy, but the outline looks pretty lazy, and there's a lot of gold bleed from underneath. Yellow, and by extension gold, is a pretty hard colour to paint over, but having seen better examples in the past, this is pretty disappointing. And yeah, these issues are really minor, but I do feel they are worth mentioning, if nothing else to accentuate how many positives this thing has. Still, there is one more complaint that pertains to an even worse problem, so remember how stupid the base mode was? Well, due to the way it transforms, this guy has a nasty habit of splitting at the sides. This in itself wouldn't be too big an issue, but the tabs holding it together are way too loose. I don't particularly know why this was a worse issue in robot mode than it was in vehicle mode, or even in the upcoming combined mode, but if I had to take a guess, it's probably because of the weight distribution, since the feet are taking the weight as opposed to the wheels. That's one thing I'll give them credit for, the feet don't actually have any wheels on them, so in terms of stability, he's on a very high level. Ultimately though, this issue won't affect display-oriented collectors, but for those who frequently like to transform their shit like myself, this will likely happen a few times. It's only a minor annoyance though, as regardless, it's an incredibly fun Lynx. The design on its own is incredibly ferocious, and the sculpt work manages to accentuate such incredibly well. However, I don't think this would work as well as it does if it wasn't for the incredibly well-done articulation. Like, Jesus, for a brick with legs is certainly not, well, a brick. The jaw opens, and the cannon is on the same hinge, but a separate cut. And although it's unfortunately limited in its side-to-side -side capacity, there's a secondary universal hinge at the base of the neck that does help rectify it. It's not a crazy amount of articulation, but it does do quite well. From here, all the legs are identical, so thankfully they're all done practically perfectly. You've got universal joints that are ratcheted in both directions, as well as a big, beefy bicep slash thigh swivel. Then at the knee, you don't just get one, but two ratcheted joints, creating a double-jointed knee. And as far as I can gather, none of these are faux ratchets either. At least from what I can feel, they're legitimate spring and gear systems. So either they went all out on the budget, or these are so good that I can't tell. And if that wasn't good enough, the feet are also ratcheted forward and have an excellent ankle tilt. Oh, and I guess the tails rotate down, but honestly, who gives a shit? So yeah, the head is average, but the legs are about as sexy as f Bayonetta. This easily takes the Lynx mode to new heights, and doesn't just bring it up to the incredibly high level that War for Cybertron figures have experienced in their articulation, but surpasses it to the highest degree. Like, this is the kind of articulation that is borderline masterpiece level. It's actually surprising though, considering his size. He's again roughly the same size as a classic leader that you would come across during the period of Dark of the Moon or earlier, and typically those figures sacrifice a lot of their articulation in order to facilitate a specific gimmick. However, in this instance, nothing save for some extra torso articulation has been lost. He's got all the chunk of a mid-2000s leader, yet none of the jank. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the bird component. Don't get me wrong, it's fine and all, but compared to his kitty counterpart, it's a slight step down. I will say that design-wise, it's definitely way more dynamic, most likely due to the awesome sculpt work that was present on the shuttle mode. As a result, the balance of goofy yet mature is hits pretty damn well. For example, the head reta- wait, I wrote retails instead of retains. Curse you typos! For example, the head retains all the lovely shuttle details. However, with Skylinks's big shit eating grin, it ends up placing a big dumb smile on your face. And fortunately, this time you're able to position it in a way where it fires the massive Omega Supreme Blast, although sadly it'll be facing down due to the weight, unfortunately. And damn, this neck is poseable. Sure, in terms of sideways motion, you only get two ratchets, but in tandem with the ball joint, it works remarkably well. And vertical movement? Man, he's got that for days. And Jesus, the detail on this thing is also remarkably well done. So many pistons and rivets and 5mm pegs. Oh, right, these are the only 5mm pegs on the bottom. That's a bit disappointing, but oh well. Now, most of the details on this thing are simple carryovers from the shuttle mode, but you do get a few new ones, such as the aforementioned neck. Lovely red plastic, by the way, but moving on, the blue wingspan is resplendent. Not only do you get the extremely lovely plastic that the Lynx mode used, but you also get a lovely helping of feather detail.
Not that kind of feathering, you idiots! It actually reminds me a lot of the detail seen on Gunpla, specifically the first real raid kit I ever built, the Strike Freedom. I've since lost that kit though, so alas I can't really compare the two, but you get the idea. And yes, you do have to deal with the slits left over from transformation, but it's not awful. And then there are the subtler details that you typically wouldn't notice, such as the tiny light at the front. Uh, Repro Labels, can you make a set to fill that in? Just an idea. But yeah, it's a giant stupid bird that puts a big dumb grin on your face, as it should. However, in comparison to the Lynx component, yeah, it's not built as well. For starters, the legs aren't great. They're sculpted brilliantly, and I especially I especially love the toe sections, but the ratchets they chose just aren't sturdy. I get the choice to use faux ratchets instead of sprung ones, given how bloody small these things are, but Jesus, the ones on the hips just feel awful. It feels like these things are gonna eventually break in a few years if I keep using them, and I suppose for most people that's not going to matter considering the main event, but this needs to be mentioned as even if the articulation is done exceptionally well, the ratchets pretty much render it null and void. Also, and this ties into the legs as well, he's way too front heavy. Getting this guy to stand on such tiny feet is a pain in the ass. Although in this instance I can give some leeway, considering that A, he needs to combine, and B, you can use the tail to support the weight. On the topic though, did they have to leave this back section hollow? This just doesn't look good at all. And it's probably the reason why the balance is thrown off so much. And finally, the wings aren't that sturdy. In their neutral position, they're fine, but when you use the extra joints to try and spread them out a bit, they have a nasty habit of drooping. Now, this could still be a QC issue, but I've tested it on a mate's copy as well, and he had the exact same thing. Thankfully, it's just a simple mushroom peg though, so tightening it up is a pretty easy thing to do. So yeah, ultimately, he's still pretty decent, but I feel compared to the Lynx, he doesn't stack up as well. Thankfully, his most pressing issues aren't going to be a problem going forward, but come on, the tail is still an annoyance. Fortunately, the articulation on said tail and practically everything else works as well as you'd hope, if not a little beyond. The jaw is basically the same as the Lynx component, with a separate hinge and cannon tongue, however this time you thankfully can't dislocate it as the jaw stops after a certain point. I personally don't like the way they've sculpted the real tongue under the cannon tongue though, I feel it just looks a little stupid. And then the neck. Oh boy, the neck. The head itself is on a ball joint with all sorts of expressiveness. The first neck module gets you side to side with one ratchet, although it's only one click in each direction. You also get a slight hinge upwards, but it pales in comparison to the second module. That has the same single click ratchet, only rotated 90 degrees, so it goes lengthways. On top of that, it has a secondary forward mounted hinge, which gets you way more range than the last one. Module 3 has roughly the same as module 2, except backwards has an extra click. It retains the extra hinge though. And finally, module 4 is similar to module 1, with one click to each side. At the base though, you get a full forward ratchet with loads of clicking points. Like holy shit, on their own, these might seem like fairly limited elements of articulation, but together they really work well. I do kind of wish that the locking ports at the base of the neck was a little more sturdy, but it works well enough. The wings also have nice clickety proper ratchets at the shoulder, a hinge outwards, a 90 degree rotation, and a mushroom peg, along with the hinges you can use to extend or retract them. So their posing should work in theory beyond the tolerances. You might need to tighten the mushroom peg up a bit though. Unfortunately, the hips, although universally ratcheted in both directions, feel pretty awful in both ways. Below that, you've got a thigh swivel, a ratcheted knee, which thankfully feels a smidge better, and a knee swivel. Finally, you cap off the legs with a ratcheted foot and an ankle tilt, as well as some toe rotation at the front and the back, which surprisingly helps with stability occasionally. You your main point of stability is going to be the tail though, and although the first hinge is pretty limited, they thankfully make up for it with the two double joints below it. The tip is also hinged in two different directions, and whilst I would have preferred ball joints to extend the articulation, I do get the importance of stability. So yeah, very well articulated on paper, and in most part in practice, but those legs man, talk about chalk and cheese. Still, I am surprised how big this guy is, he practically explodes in size after transformation, and when you put these guys together, you start to wonder how the f*** they managed to achieve all the budget they did. Seriously, what the f***? I mean, had they charged 200, I could understand it, but not 150. This is some serious budgeting wizardry. But with that, it's finally time to move on to the main event. Although, let's be real here, you probably don't need instructions to transform it. It basically boils down to fold in the lynx's head and the bird feet and then combine it as you normally would. And yes, you'll be happy to know that you don't have to disconnect them in order to combine them. They can convert together without the need for parts forming. Which I suppose these days, given the advent of cliff jumper, RC and double dealer, it sadly needs to be specified. I do recommend extending the legs a little bit higher though, as it helps accentuate the silhouette. And oh my f God, this guy's awesome! I mean, to many this might seem pretty obvious, but when you really think about it, Skylinx is a f weirdo. He's an exploded shuttle on top of four legs, so hypothetically it shouldn't work. Hell, in Combiner Wars they omitted the separation gimmick entirely, and that could have been taken as a limitation of the size class, but let's be real here, no one thought they'd do something like this at such a high price tag, let alone less than a decade after the last one, let alone surpassing that price tag in practically every way. Right off the bat, they basically take the worst elements of each mode and hide them between the combined mode. Oh, the head's not the best in the Lynx component? Well, now it's folded away so it doesn't matter. Oh, the legs aren't the best in the bird component? Well, now they're folded away into the sides. And you've got big meaty clonk instead. The tail cavity still kind of sucks though, but at least the tail itself doesn't have to act as a tripod anymore. What really surprised me is how cohesive everything is. You look at the sides and you think they would be very gappy and confusing, but even in spite of the feet on the side, this feels like one continuous robot mode. Like five years ago, they flat out refused to make these guys split, since it would potentially ruin the cohesiveness. Yet here we are with an even more cohesive Griffin mode than the previous attempt. At least I think it's a Griffin. Is it a Griffin? It's a Skylinks, that's for sure, but beyond that, uh...
Look, 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 I'm gonna be honest, discussing this guy in depth is somewhat difficult because I've already discussed how well everything works in each individual mode, and if I went over why Skylinks works so well in combined mode, I'd just be repeating myself. The detail is, again, amazing. The paintwork is, again, amazing. The proportions are, again, amazing. The articulation is basically all the good parts of each separate robot mode with none of the issues like the unarticulated head on the Lynx and the wonky legs on the bird. He's basically a perfect Skylinx with a fixable side caveat of the wonky wings. Seriously, I want to get this video done so I can just fix those. Let's be real here. In the end, what can you really do? Repeat yourself and drag out the video to a ridiculous length? No, I don't think that's right. So quickly, to finish off, here's how big he is, here he is with a bunch of robots, and here he is with Predaking because apparently people want to see those two together. Now, what should you do? I'll tell you what you should do. You should go out and buy this 100%. The street date for the United States, as far as I'm concerned, is sometime in October? And looking at my analytics, a large chunk of you are Americans. When this lovely bastard hits the shelves, you need to pick him up. The fact that we're even in this situation is astonishing to begin with. Remember when the head of Hasbro refused to release a Skylinks on the basis of simply not liking the character? Yeah, that was a thing, and there are the threads to prove it. Also, this comment. Oh dear, what a shame. So ultimately, we are truly in an amazing situation. Not only has a character as interesting as Skylinks received an update, not only has it received a second chance on top of that, and not only do we have a new size class to go with it, but we have received a truly amazing figure that somehow surpasses the very price tag they set up. I believe that the name they gave the shuttle is the best way to summarize this truly amazing figure. Magnificence. Jetfire was good and all, and probably better than his overcomplicated fans toys counterpart, but he didn't have that specific magnificence that graces Skylinks. This is the kind of toy that people will be talking about for years to come, the kind of toy people will be scouring the aftermarket for when everyone already has theirs. The opportunity to purchase for the rest of the world is coming soon, and when it reaches your hands, grasp it with all your might. So I guess in the end, the real question isn't about the score, it's really about where it's going to end up on my 2020 list. And you know what? I have a pretty good idea where he's going to stay until the year concludes. I mean, there's no guarantee and all, but Jesus f***ing Christ, this is a truly masterful figure. And I suppose that brings me to the next and probably the final question. Has this finally quelled my skepticism for the Commander Class line? No, it f hasn't, if anything, now I'm even more skeptical! Seriously, what can they do after this? If the Kingdom Rumors are true, what can they do to truly surpass this? Is there anything? I don't know. I mean, I guess Commander Class in general could probably do a broadside, or maybe a tidal wave, or maybe a star set. Nah, nah, they wouldn't do that. If they did any of those, would they really top this guy? I just don't know if they would. Whatever they do, though, they've got massively big shoes to fill, to the point where they may be up to an impossible task. But in the end, that's not knocking the design team of the future. That is merely a testament to the design team of f it's it's raining. Uh, you know what? I, I I've I've been working on this episode for like two weeks, and I cannot be f refilming this whole intro and outro sequence. You know what? The Skylinks is great. You guys all know he's great. Just go buy him. Uh, yeah, f this rain. This toy's f awesome. Peace out. Oh shit! I've left the clothes on. They're on the line.